Even some of the smallest creatures of Monster Hunter would still be considered megafauna in our world, and many of them are titanic beasts the size of the largest dinosaurs. As such, much is written of their power, danger, and destructive potential, and as such huge, mobile, and interactive animals, they'll no doubt have significant impacts on the environments in which they live. But why should it be assumed that they're all negative? What do monsters do for the environments, and in turn the people, that they share them with? So to start off, what exactly are ecosystem services? Put loosely, ecosystem services are the benefits people obtain from ecosystems. They're any necessary action or impact an ecosystem has or does that humans no longer need to spend time, money, or effort doing for themselves. Something as simple as a fruiting tree or bush is an example of ecosystem services. It's an ecosystem providing food humans can eat without humans having to do anything to get it but it's also more complex and wide-ranging, and can involve physical, practical uses like pollination, carbon storage, timber, or fresh water, as well as less tangible ones, like mental health benefits and areas of cultural importance. So how many monsters contribute to all of that? A good chunk of the monsters seen in Fort are carnivorous, and carnivores by their nature often kill things, and in general a lot of conflict stems from this, but the way they do so can regulate ecosystems in beneficial ways. One of the most useful for people is regulating species that can be as or more troublesome, but are far harder to control. Mesopredators and other animals on lower trophic niches often live in larger groups or greater densities, and breed quicker and mature faster. In short, they're very hard to actually put a dent in their numbers of, much like Apex or Top Predator, Miso Predator can be a bit of a woolly term, and can be dependent on the context of its use. In the intact Predator Guild of Yellowstone, a coyote is a Miso Predator, but in the suburbs of California, it's a Top Order Predator. Similarly, such animals don't have to be carnivoran mammals. Some primates are considered Miso Predators, as are corvids among birds. So, in the world of Monster Hunter, small bird wyverns like dromes and greats can be considered mesopredators, as well as other animals like azuros and royal ludroth, that may still exert some predation pressure and have some meat in their diet. And animals like this suffer a heavy toll from larger, top-order predators. In our own world, a third of all mesopredator deaths are from predation from larger carnivores and this increases with the more top predators there are in an ecosystem. So the richer and more intact the environment, the stronger the impacts. In some areas, even a single species can take between a quarter and a third of some mesopredators. So all in all, larger, dominant predators significantly crop down the numbers of smaller ones. Again, we see this in Monster Hunter, where the mesopredators pay a heavy toll to the larger co-predators potentially even being killed out of proportion to their abundance. But what's the so what of this? How does it actually help people? Well, it's worth looking at some areas where carnivores are extirpated to see how smaller predators can really take over. In some areas of Africa where the carnivore guilds were locally extinct, olive baboon numbers rose by over 300% and became incredibly common. Small antelope species and smaller primates declined significantly in number two, but most prevalently for this video, human-wildlife conflict increased hugely. Baboons readily feed on both crops and livestock of farmers, and in some cases it's so severe that school children are held back to help guard the farms. Baboons also share significant pathogen and parasite overlap with people, and cause spikes in such illnesses where common too. And this is a hugely common problem across Africa, where large predators only occupy tiny amounts of their ranges, and only really in protected areas. There are numerous factors that can cause baboon increases, but the strongest variable by far was lion and leopard decreases especially. Baboons present a very strong example of how getting rid of top predators can really exacerbate problems. But such conflict exists across much of the globe with predators like coyotes, foxes, raccoons, and small felids. Species which are typically heavily hunted. 
But despite this, humans never seem to succeed in having the same effect as carnivores. Despite the utterly indefensible practices of things like killing contests, and government agencies literally spending millions to try and eradicate coyotes, humans fail to put much of a lasting dent in their numbers, even when they comprise their leading cause of mortality, and such things may even make conflict worse. But wolves have been shown to suppress or even extirpate coyotes in areas they recolonize. Carnivores are just more successful at controlling mesopredators, because it's not just simple killing, and in some cases, demographics of killed mesopredators can often seem pretty similar to the impacts humans have. But a predator's role in an ecosystem isn't just a weekend job or hobby. It's a permanent presence with effects on where mesopredators roam, have their young, or choose to rest, that can often result in less space for them. And we know such conflict also exists in Monster Hunter 2. Bird wyverns harass caravans, intrude on farms, and even attempt to predate people out foraging too. As such, occasional culls are commissioned, and hunters regularly take out problem animals. To consider a population increase of several hundred percent in their number, and it's clear that there'd be a very big problem indeed. Strongly interactive carnivore species can also have other impacts on each other that can be beneficial for humans too and can change their social behaviour. Coyotes weren't the only carnivores influenced by wolf reintroduction to Yellowstone. Cougars were too. But as well as the expected mortality, both direct and influenced starvation from wolves stealing kills, wolves actually caused cougar populations to stabilise. There's less intraspecific mortality, and it's believed the presence of wolves encouraged female cougars to keep their young with them for longer periods, thus increasing their dispersing survival rates. It may also be a benefit to have the greater vigilance of a group when dangerous competitors often show up to your kills. A tighter group of predators may sound like the opposite of a good thing, but less of them wandering around reduces encounter rates with people, and also reduces disease transmission. A more cohesive group that all gets sick may all still perish, or serve as reservoirs for it, but a fractured one is much more likely to spread it as they move around in different areas, and unstable populations often have increased dispersal that can aid in disease transmission too. Again, this can have real implications for the world of Monster Hunter, where bird wyverns have the potential to be reservoirs for diseases like the Frenzy Virus. A scattered, fractured group has the potential to make it a lot worse. As is fairly well known, predators also affect their prey as well as competitors. Much has been written and said especially about wolves and elk or deer, but again, what's the so what of this to villagers? It's all very well and good talking about how they've restored the forest, but what are the tangible benefits to the people who live in such areas? And despite it being one of the major points of conflict, predators can still have some benefits to livestock. Predators tend to select for the sick or the weak, and thus this reduces parasite and pathogen load in wild prey species. This not only makes for healthier herds, but also means there's less risk of spillover from wild herds into domestic ones. Potential illnesses can have devastating impacts on livestock, and we see in-game small villages often use tamed wild herbivores for either meat or beasts of burden when both in sedentary villages and on the move. Such animals will take a comparatively long time to grow, and are incredibly useful to such small communities, and their loss would be a considerable impact, one that can be mitigated by less risk of wild diseases. Despite being accused of natural disasters, monsters may actually help to prevent them. Through restoring certain plants and areas by reducing grazing and browsing pressure there, predators can change rivers for the better, encouraging plant growth and preventing erosion and flood risk. Considering some settlements are built by rivers for trade, transport and fishing, not flooding is a considerable benefit. It's worth noting too, it's not just the killing that makes predators have an impact, but it's fear, too. Fear of predation or understanding of risk plays a big part in prey decisions, and it could even be that the landscape of fear carnivores create is actually as or more important. This is why it's hard to replicate the effects carnivores can have with just culling. 
Because it's more than just decreasing the numbers, it's changing the very behaviours too. The impacts predators have are just difficult to achieve without them. Carnivores also enrich the lands with their kills. The act of depositing carcasses causes nutrient cycling and can transfer significant amounts of nitrogen and other substances to improve the quality of the soil. Along with general ecosystem health and functioning, this can still have significant local importance. Even if many of the villages have farms, people in the world of Monster Hunter are still dependent on things like herbs or mushrooms for their medicinal or vitamin purposes, and there's often quests requesting that hunters gather such items for villages, as presumably the small farms can't keep up with demand for what is their only real source of medicine. Similarly, a lot of food or sellable items may come from forage too, and overall foraging still has considerable importance for a lot of villages, both economically and immediately, so a functioning, healthy ecosystem is vital for them to be able to take everything they need. But there's a lot more than just carnivores and predators in the world of Monster Hunter, and a number of other species can have significant impacts too. There are a number of giant herbivores in Monster Hunter, with the Brute Wyverns Duramboros and Banbaro, Gamoth, the Bloss Wyverns, and Congolala. Many of these herbivores will move over huge areas in their search for food, and in doing so deposit seeds. Doing so over long distance can help strengthen and repopulate ecosystems. Modern African elephants are believed to carry some 50% of the seeds they eat at least 2.5 kilometers, and could potentially carry even more for over 50. Extinctions of megafauna may have caused changes to unique ecosystem services in seed dispersal that other animals couldn't replicate. In harsher environments like deserts and tundras, this may be doubly important, where low numbers of animals mean it's less likely other herbivores may do so, and where any increases in certain fruiting plants can make all the difference. Such herbivores helping in seed dispersal may also buffer these ecosystems significantly against freak climate spikes that may cause local extinctions of plants that the herbivores can restore. Some plants may well just be dependent on large monsters to transport them anywhere and maintain populations full stop. In other ways, diet can help, and another is reducing the risk of wildfires. Whilst in their own right natural fires can be an ecologically important and helpful process, they can still be a threat to people and burn down large tracts of land. Again, the actions of mega herbivores can prevent this. Large herbivores can deal with poor quality forage better than smaller ones, and so often bulk graze. As such, they take in large volumes of low quality plant material. This can include tall grasses and unpalatable parts of them. And through eating so much of them, giant herbivores like rhinos can significantly reduce fire risk. In a similar vein, Duramboros is also content with large volumes of low quality forage, and often eats dead trees and other potential fuel load. As well as the reduction of fuel for the fires, the consumption of dead trees especially gets rid of fuel ladders, that allow fires to climb vertically, spread even further, and start crown fires. So through their constant grazing and trampling through the trees helping to open things up, Duramboros likely significantly decrease the risk of wildfires. Duramboros may help people in areas where they overlap in other ways too, and are generally a very important animal for local ecosystems. In some parts of India, Asian elephants are vital for keeping wetlands fully functioning. To start, their dung enriches the water and provides food for fish but their movements also help significantly. The huge weight behind their footsteps changes the topography of the wetland benthos, providing more varied habitat for more species and encouraging plant growth. These impacts are key to good populations of assorted species of fish, that the indigenous fisher folk are dependent on, and they also use elephant corridors to better move through forests too. A lack of elephants threatens their livelihood, and for villages around places like the flooded forest and misty peaks, it's likely the same story with their reliance on Duramboros to keep things functioning. The elephants also eat invasive water plants and hold them at bay, and this is another key role large herbivores can play. Again, the huge volumes of food they take in means so long as it's somewhat palatable, mega herbivores can put away significant amounts of alien plants. 
This is also seen in African elephants too. In areas where they underwent a decline, invasive plant species swiftly began to multiply and take over ecosystems. Like a good many benefits such animals provide, a lot of them may only become really apparent after they're gone. In other ways, monsters can provide for assorted local communities too. Baroth's actions in arid areas likely enlarges and deepens waterholes, making them more common and permanent fixtures in the environment that indigenous people may rely on. The Samburu in Kenya often rely on the local knowledge of elephants to find water and dig it out. So similarly, desert peoples may do the same with assorted species in Monster Hunter. The rootling actions for large monsters is an example of biotubation, and this is pretty widespread behaviour in Monster Hunter. Through their movement or foraging, Baroth, Yans, Garuga, and Kutku, Bulldrome, the Blosswivens, Celtus, Agnactor, Banbaro, Duramboros, and Glavinus, among others, all take part in biotubation of the soils, and for some of them, it's confirmed that this has a noticeable impact on improving plant growth. Biotubation reduces soil compaction and increases its nutrient cycling, as well as its moisture, microbe diversity, and plant recruitment. For it to be such a widespread behaviour across so many large animals, it's clear that they're at least partially responsible for such highly productive ecosystems, through their extensive tilling of the soil. It's not just physical actions similar to our own world too, but the weird elements used by assorted monsters may also have similar benefits to certain key crops needed by villages. Traditional Japanese farmers believed lightning increased mushroom yields, and experiments actually showed this was true. Replicating this in a lab, electrical pulses could double or otherwise significantly increase yields of mushrooms, so the assorted thunder monsters may well do the same with their blasts. In the case of Kezu, this may actually help their own predation. They zap something to capture it, more fungi grows in the zap site, that attracts more animals to be eaten, and so on. But for more wide-ranging creatures like Xenoga and Astalos, that seem to regularly discharge thunder, it may have important boosts on mushroom crops that are some of the most important medicinal ingredients in the Monster Hunter world. While some of these points may seem more vague or tangential, again, it can't be stressed enough how in a world that is still significantly dependent on foraging, how important a strong functioning ecosystem with good nutrient cycling and species diversity is to provide all of that forage, and how a lot of monsters significantly contribute to producing that. A common reply to the hunting video that's worth discussing here was that monsters should be hunted to control their numbers and prevent an overpopulation of monsters destroying everything. This is incredibly unlikely. As established, most smaller monsters will chiefly be controlled from above by larger predators, and this is actually likely to be the same case with the larger predators themselves. Once top order carnivores reach certain densities or carrying capacities, things get violent quickly and their chief cause of mortality is often their own species. In wolves, once densities reach a certain level, there's a significant spike in intraspecific mortality, as their pack warfare and the killing of dispersals ramps up to prevent any further growth. And this is a set density, it's not dependent on the amount of resources in the area. So wolves regulate their own numbers in accordance with their own territories, and wolves become intolerable to one another once they reach a certain number. Brown bears at carrying capacity often kill each other, especially the large males killing younger individuals of any gender, to the point of it limiting cub success significantly, and big cats in areas without heavy anthropogenic mortality kill each other with reasonable frequency too. In managed metapopulations, large predators do need managing for their genetic diversity, but outside of that, top order predators don't need to be controlled. They control themselves just fine. It can't be stressed enough how a lot of predator control campaigns are deeply unscientific policies that are more likely to make things worse than anything else, as well as often just being generally disgraceful on all fronts. Monsters will compete fiercely with their own kind, and there's no reason to think that they wouldn't follow similar patterns of intraspecific mortality at high densities, so the worry of a plague of Rathalos or any other monster is poorly founded, and monster numbers likely don't need controlling. 
Efforts to do so may only trigger ecological imbalance that can take years to undo. Even for the giant herbivores that aren't really controlled by predation, they're not especially likely to attack human settlements, but they still only get as numerous as their environment allows. The Blosswivens live in very harsh areas with huge territories to supply their huge needs. One without such a territory isn't very likely to survive, and almost certainly starves unless it can use up one. Incredibly harsh environments don't facilitate huge numbers of large animals being produced quickly. It's worth noting too, it's pretty rare for a monster to actually attack a village. All of the quests for Rathalos hunts around Kokoto don't actually come from the village itself, that seemingly never had a direct attack from one despite incredibly close proximity, and them often raiding its nest. And this is despite the comparatively high turnover of individuals that can often trigger conflict too. The Tigrex resident to poke was killed for the hunter to prove themselves, and the Lagiacrus was killed as a scapegoat for Seodius, and the chief didn't even think it was the likely culprit. Most apex level monsters are too large to consider humans as prey, and so most villagers don't have resources they're interested in taking. So even if there was an overpopulation somehow, humans needn't worry more so than usual. A final caveat is that of elder dragons. Elders have potentially the highest rate of environmental impact, with constant accusations of them destroying them. They're also nomadic in nature, so their localised effects aren't likely long term. But even then, such accusations may be unfair. Many elders are at least partially extremophiles, often preferring environments like areas of active volcanicity or arid deserts, especially the more destructive ones like the incendiary Teostra and Lunastra. But in extreme low productivity environments, Influential species can otherwise have reduced impacts. With such low densities of herbivores and so little fuel for fires, it's pretty difficult to burn down a desert, or to make an area like a volcano even less hospitable. You just can't destroy what isn't there, so a good deal of elder-based hand wringing may be for naught, to say nothing of the fact that most wildlife will have likely had ample evolutionary time to have some appropriate reaction to dealing with elders. The film The Legends of the Guild also hints at something else too as to their impact. The Lunastra in the film burns down much of a forest, which is an unusual record for one outside their usual roaming areas for a start, and generally threatens the village, before a dam is broken and she's swept away. So it's tempting to say Lunastra is every bit as destructive as quests imply, but the dry forest she ignited wasn't the initial habitat of that area. The scale of the dam and the water it was holding back suggests that seasonally it was a flooded valley or swamp that was only such a dry area due to human activities. If in its initial state, Lunastra would have struggled to ignite anything with all the groundwater, and in such a damp area, and even if she succeeded, the flames likely wouldn't have spread. In short, elders may only have such extreme impacts in areas humans have already modified for themselves first. They have no discrimination for human crops or other agriculture, and the sedentary farming practices of villages may well put them at risk. Similarly, elders are often attracted to human areas due to abnormally high concentrations of minerals, especially ones like gunpowder that they seek to consume, as is the case with Teostra and Gogmazios. Humans are still animals, and ones that can have significant impacts of ecosystems and their functioning themselves. You can't blame an elder dragon for being an animal, but their damage can't be ignored either, and human elder conflict and competition is rife through the series. As said in the hunting video, it's hard to replicate solutions used on real life animals due to the power of monster hunters. Trying to create a giant bear bin for all a town's gunpowder still probably won't stop a Gogmazios, and trying to haze a Teostra probably just results in a fight. But it could be possible selecting for certain areas to build settlements, or playing to the strengths of the locations of different villages as to what they produce, could be a method of minimising damage and conflict as well as human impacts. All of this is not to say that living with monsters, or indeed any large animal, is a picnic. It's very easy to talk about how much megafauna can pay when you don't have to suffer how much megafauna can cost. 
but that they do have hugely important roles in ecosystem functioning that mean that overall they're a net benefit to humanity, even with the potential hazard that they can cause. At least some of the thoughts for this video started when I uploaded the hunting video last year, and found a great deal of the comments talking about how monsters often needed to be hunted, and only really seemed to focus on the hazard causes, and not the jeopardy reckless hunting could potentially bring about, which I thought was the more relevant takeaway. Again, to be clear, these are just fictitious monsters, and the conclusions here may have dubious application in the actual canon of the games at best, but at the same time I think such videos are worthwhile to make, for both initial analogous educative value and information for other people's fiction, as the actual importance a lot of animals can have on keeping ecosystems running smoothly is only coming to light in more recent years as they get more threatened, and we seemingly get more committed to ruining the planet. This video also became a lot harder to make than I thought too, as a lot of the research done so far on the potential for animal ecosystem services is often directly related to repairing them, them clearing up human messes like habitat destruction and climate change, two things the world of Monster Hunter won't have to worry about for a few hundred years. Trying to find the smaller scale, more direct benefits to humans living in the communities seen in the game was more difficult, but hopefully this video still has some worthwhile content to watch. And thanks for watching if you got this far. And especially to top patrons Big Al and Venomenon for their ongoing support, as well as Kay Sandum, Erengar Steiny, Sassy Birdo, Evely, Howleth, Archazor Queen, Seth Fake Last Name, Zaysi, and Bazugazu Bachohatsu Bachomatsu for their continuing kindness in keeping the channel going. If you're interested in supporting the channel yourself, there's a link to the Patreon, and I'm grateful for any amount you feel you can give. Likes, shares, and subscriptions are also all appreciated. If there's truly a takeaway from the last video, it's that I should play Mordor Shadow of War, who apparently beat me to the chase with the idea for Deviants. Some of the apparent in-law stuff for Bloodbath is also different, but then I'm not sure a lot of that was especially sound. Apparently the discoloration is meant to be blood, but why isn't there ready brown unless it's exclusively killing Carapacians? And why is the horn the least saturated part if this is the chief weapon doing the splattering and goring? It also doesn't look like random splatters so much as actual uniform changes in the skin colour too, but whatever. The next video will be a surprise because I haven't started working on the script yet, but it will be the last of these broader topics in Monster Hunter, and then after that it's back to normal species profiles. Though either way I hope I'll see you there for it.